Johnstown is located on the western side of the Allegheny Mountains in western Pennsylvania, as you see here. And the dam that was built that eventually collapsed and flooded Johnstown is 15 miles to the northeast and 450 feet above an elevation. Now, why was the dam and reservoir built? Well, it was built for the canal system of Pennsylvania. See, in the early 19th century, this is how they moved people and goods across Pennsylvania. They started the canal system in 1826 to compete with New York's Erie Canal. At the Allegheny Mountains, they had to use steam-powered hoist to get the canal boats up over the mountains. The boats would then be let into the canals near Johnstown, which was on the western side of the Alleghenies, which then connected to the Allegheny River. However, there was a problem. During the summer months, the canals west of Johnstown would dry up. So their solution was to build a reservoir dam just northeast of Johnstown so that they could discharge water to the canals during these dry months. An engineer from the state designed the dam. Construction started in 1836. It was completed in 1852, 16 years later. It was only to be a four-year project. However, cash flow from Pennsylvania was the problem in completing in four years. The reservoir was two miles long and one mile wide. The dam was an earth dam constructed of horizontal layers of clay, slate, and large rock, which was the acceptable method for the construction of dams in those days. The overall length was 930 feet. The top crest of the dam was 75 feet. The bottom base was 270 feet. The spillway was cut into the rock hillside adjacent to the dam at 10 foot lower and 72 foot in width. This is critical as time will tell. There are five cast iron discharge pipes, two foot in diameter at the center. They were set in stone culverts as a way to release the water down the South Fork River to the canals near Johnstown. They also built a wooden tower to control the flow of water and the level of the reservoir. By the time they finished the dam in 1852, they didn't need the canal system anymore. The railroad was now in existence and they found a way to climb over the Allegheny Mountains through the Horseshoe Curve near Altoona six months after the reservoir was completed. The state was out of business in the canal system. They didn't need the dam nor its maintenance, therefore they let the dam go unattended. They didn't have any money to do anything with it. Now there was speculation that some of the locals were stealing the lead from the discharge pipe when the reservoir was left unattended. This created serious leaks around the culverts and the reservoir was only half full at the time and the creeks were very low at the time. Ten years later, in June of 1862, a heavy storm caused the top of the dam to collapse and the area around the culverts. There was no one there to drain the reservoir when the water crested at the top of the dam. It caused little alarm in the valley below in Johnstown and caused no damage as the reservoir was only half full. It crested and eventually abated after the storm. At the time, the reservoir was half full and the wooden control tower had since caught fire and burned down. Some people at that time said the reservoir was just an oversized pond with the deepest point at 10 foot. Now, John Riley, a railroad official from nearby Altoona, bought it a few years later in 1875. However, he didn't do anything with it. He left it unattended, and between the state ownership and Riley's ownership, it was neglected for 27 years. However, either Riley or the locals had removed the remaining portions of the iron discharge pipes for scrap. Four years later, in 1879, Riley sells the dam to Benjamin Ruff, who's a tunnel engineer. By this time, the reservoir had risen to a height of 40 feet. Now, Ruff plans to make it into a mountain resort for the wealthy industrialists from Pittsburgh. You see, that area of the Allegheny Plateau, the small towns that were close to the reservoir, was a resort area for the wealthy people of Pittsburgh who wanted to escape their pollution during the summer months. Andrew Carnegie of, of Carnegie Steel was the wealthiest person in the United States at that time. He had a summer home in nearby Crescent, which is about 10 miles away. Now, Ruff's friends with Henry Frick, who's Andrew Carnegie's right-hand man in the steel business. So Benjamin Ruff, he's acting as a developer, and he decides that he would set up the reservoir as a club. He would sell shares to these wealthy people from Pittsburgh. 
all of these people were business associates of Carnegie Steel. They were the leaders in the steel business, the coal business, the railroad business, and the banking industry. Now, Ruff raises 17000 from the membership, and with the money, he's able to repair the dam that was damaged in 1852. He just hires laborers, though, to repair the top of the dam with just mud and brush and anything else he can find to repair it. He doesn't install those discharge pipes that were removed. The reservoir level was only 40 feet, and he just figured that it didn't need those discharge pipes. He also boards up the stone culverts that were damaged during the flood of 52. And there's no control tower that he puts back in either. He also cuts the top of the crest of the dam down three feet to widen it to make room for two carriages to pass one another. He looks at the original spillway, which is 10 foot lower and it's cut into the rock hillside. It's 72 foot wide. But he determines it's just too much money to do anything with that spillway as far as lowering it. And he abandons that. Now, that's critical as time will tell. Now, he does all this repair without consulting an engineer. There's no drawings that he puts together. There's no governing agency reviewing his repair work at, at the dam. He has no experience in waterworks or hydrology or dam construction. He figures he's smart enough. He can figure it out himself. And then he buys $1,000 worth of black bass from Erie, and he stocks a reservoir, and, and he calls the reservoir the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. And then to save the fish from escaping, he builds a fish guard at the spillway, and that's critical. Because with the fish guard and the wooden piers at the bridge, it is going to restrict the flow of water over the spillway. Now, Ruff opens up the club in 1880, and the members started to show up, and they built cottages at this lake. There were 16 privately owned cottages, along with a 47-room clubhouse for members that didn't have cottages. These families would come by train two hours from Pittsburgh during the summer months and would mingle and party together. And they had an annual regatta, they had music festivals, they had fishing and hunting outings. They had several canoes and sailboats and one yacht for their pleasure on the lake. And the club was, was named the most exclusive millionaire's resort in America at that time. Now, the club had 61 families that were members at the time of the flood in 1889. As I stated, the city of Johnstown is 14 miles southwest and 450 feet lower in elevation in a valley basin. It's an industrial city supplying steel for the nation. It's the largest producer of barbed wire, plowshares, and rails for the railroads. Cambria Ironworks was the company that produced the steel and a man named Daniel Morrell ran the company. It was a company town. They invested $50 million in the town as they built the plant and all of the company houses for the workers. There were 7,000 workers in the steel plant working two shifts. These were hardworking, hard scrabble Eastern European immigrants who worked in this plant. From 1880 to 1889, Johnstown's population grew from 15,000 to 30,000. Now, Daniel Morrell of Camry Ironworks in Johnstown, he's concerned around the time that Ruff buys and repairs the dam. He sends his right-hand man at the plant, a man named John Fulton, a mining engineer and geologist, to inspect the dam and the repairs that were made. Fulton meets with two club members and reviews the work and came away unsatisfied, and he wrote a report to Morrell. The reservoir height was only 40 feet when he inspected the dam repairs. He didn't think the dam repairs were done in a careful and substantial manner or with care demanded in a large structure of this kind. Now Fulton writes in his report to Morrell that he saw some leaks at that time and he requested that the dam be lowered to repair the leaks. And he asked for these discharge pipes 
that were removed to be reinstalled so that they could lower the reservoir and make these repairs. He also recommends that the, they should have an overhauling of the present lining of the upper slopes on both sides of the dam. He requests that the spillways be lowered since they lowered the crest of the dam. And he states in his report that if the re reservoir got to the 60-foot level, it might break the dam during a flood without these necessary repairs. Now, Morell gets this report from Fulton, and he sends it to Ruff, which Ruff replies in a letter and a famous quote, You and your people are in no danger from our enterprise. Now, Morell immediately responds back and says, Hey, we'll help you with the repair cost. Again, Ruff says, We don't need your help. Again, as I stated earlier, Ruff has no engineering drawings for the repair of this dam, nor was there an inspection agency overseeing his repairs. So he did what he felt was necessary to repair the dam and still be within budget. And from 1880 to 1889, there were no heavy rains that did any damage to the dam. And in these years, the level rose from 40 feet up to 60 feet, nearly full brim. The reservoir just filled up throughout the years from the streams and the creeks. There was really no way to release the water as the reservoir rose as the spillway height was near the height of the breast of the dam, and he did not have any discharge pipes. Now, Morell dies in 1885, and Ruff, the original developer who put this all together, he dies in 1887. The wealthy people from Pittsburgh continue to enjoy their summer vacations at the lake. They continue to enjoy their summer parties and their annual regatta along with fishing and hunting. These people had no idea what transpired with Ruff and the rebuilding of this dam. They were told everything was fine with the rebuilding of the dam. Then in late May of 1889, the heavy rains came in from Kansas through the Ohio Valley into southwestern Pennsylvania, and on May 31st, 1889, this heavy downpour of rain at the reservoir was nine inches, and it rose the reservoir a foot an hour during the day. The top of the dam right after noon hour began to leak. Now, John Park was the maintenance engineer during that time. He had his laborers patch the dam during this heavy downpour. When he saw that it was futile, he raced to the town of South Fork on horseback to notify the people of Johnstown by telegraph that the dam was ready to break. His message was a little too late to notify all the people of Johnstown. The water crested over the dam in the afternoon and the dam collapsed at 3.10 p.m. A wall of water came gushing out and it took 45 minutes to drain the reservoir. There were 1.5 billion gallons of water, 20 million tons of water weight, it came gushing down a valley at 40 to 50 feet high at 40 miles an hour as it came into Johnstown. It took 50 minutes to reach Johnstown and it wiped it out within 10 minutes.
at the stone bridge at the south end of town, 30 acres of debris piled up and started to burn, and hundreds of people were trapped and died. 2,209 people died. 99 whole families were wiped out. 1,600 homes were destroyed. Four square miles of Johnstown was wiped out. 23,000 survivors were left homeless. There was $17 million in damage done, or $483 million, or a half a billion in today's dollars. After the destruction, the town began to rebuild. There was an outpouring of support to help from all over the nation and the world as money and goods came into Johnstown. This was the greatest man-made catastrophe ever in the United States up to that time. 7,000 men came in from all over to help with this rebuilding. There was over $4 million that came in. By June 7th, 200 carloads of provisions came in to help the people rebuild the city. The army was there to distribute the goods. The newly organized Red Cross with Clara Barton came in with 50 doctors and nurses. By July, the mill started up again. The people of Johnstown were looking for retribution, and by the end of July in 1889, the first suit was brought against the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club for $50,000 by a woman with eight children who lost her husband. In August of the same year, Johnstown businessmen organized to sue the club. Now, Knox and Reed, who were members, were the attorneys that defended the club in Pittsburgh at the Allegheny Courthouse. They argued that it was a natural disaster and that the dam would have failed regardless. The dam collapse, they stated, was an act of God or a visitation of providence. Well, both cases were thrown out of the court as the judge and the juries agreed with the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club's attorneys. The survivors had no precedent cases to present to the courts. No money was ever received by the survivors from the members through any suit. You see, Benjamin Ruff, the original developer, he was dead and it was hard to prove that any member of the club had been personally negligent. The members themselves knew no more about the structural character of the dam than anyone in Johnstown. They were told that the dam was properly engineered and properly maintained. These members never questioned the structural stability of the dam, but if they would have thought about it, they would have realized that an earth dam without means for controlling the level of the water it contained was not a very good idea. These hardworking blue collar people from Johnstown really didn't have a prepared case. They had no reports or precedent cases to back up their case. They simply didn't have the money for it. However, for their case, there was an engineering report performed by an engineer named H.W. Brickenhoff of the Engineering and Building Record, a professional journal in New York. He reviewed the collapsed dam in July of 1889. In his report, he noted, quote, that at no time during the process of rebuilding the dam was any engineer, whatever, young or old, good or bad, known or unknown, engaged or consulted in this work. There was no evidence that the dam had ever been inspected periodically, occasionally, or even once by anyone who, by any stretch of clarity, could be regarded as an expert. There was no control level of the dam and no discharge pipes to keep the dam at least 10 to 12 feet below the crest of the dam, end quote. Also, if they had money for a hydraulic engineering analysis of the dam for their court case, it would have helped. Now, there was one that was recently done in 2016 by the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. They confirmed that the changes made to the dam by the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club severely reduced the ability of the dam to withstand major storms. They stated by the lowering of the dam three feet and failing to replace the five discharge pipes at the base of the dam cut in half the safe discharge capacity of the dam. As I stated earlier, 
During the trials against the owners of the club, the people of Johnstown had no precedent case to bring up. However, there was a precedent case that happened in England in 1862. The case was Rylands versus Fletcher. Rylands built a dam that collapsed and damaged the mine shafts on the property of Fletcher. Fletcher brings suit and the courts had determined that if you build a non-natural structure, such as a dam, and it breaks and does damage to another property, then you are held liable for the damage. Therefore, Fletcher was awarded damages from Rylands. This case was ignored in the courts of the United States at that time. It was accepted after this catastrophe in the late 19th century and all of the 20th century. Now, I believe that with H.W. Brickerhoff's report, along with the hydraulic analysis and this precedent case of Rylands versus Fletcher's, that the survivors could have won their court case against the wealthy owners for the failure of their dam. Now, they might have had to move the venue out of Allegheny Courthouse into another county, possibly Camry County or neighboring Westmoreland County. Nonetheless, several members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club gave money to the relief efforts in rebuilding Johnstown. Andrew Carnegie gave $10,000 and he built a library for the town. The people of Johnstown buried their dead and mourned and the town rebuilt. So what do we learn from this catastrophe that killed 2,209 people? Well, Ruff should have consulted with experienced construction and design professionals at the beginning when he was in the process of buying a property to make it into a resort. Professionals that have built and designed dams before. So number one recommendation, provide design and construction professionals on your projects. They can determine the necessary repairs and come up with a preliminary estimate and schedule. And their recommendation on this project would have probably been in line with Fulton's report. And then to qualify these professionals for the proper expertise and experience, I'm going to get into the next video about qualifying professionals. Three, have design or construction professionals provide quality control on your project. I'll get into quality control on how we approach it on a separate video. And then four, provide periodic inspections by your design professionals. Have, uh, have them come out to the job site on a predetermined time to ensure that the project's being built in accordance with their design. So I want to do three more of these reviews of structural failures to see what we can learn from them. And I'll try to get them out in the next coming weeks. Thank you.